In the 1880s, at the Valentine Telegraph School in Janesville, a teacher named George Parker sold pens to his telegraphy students, but found that he spent a lot of time repairing them. Fountain pens were not exactly reliable. We'll have to postpone our business. The ink has dried up. He went out and he bought some hand tools and started experimenting with ways to improve their reliability. He had some pens made that incorporated his design improvements. That was the beginning of Parker Pens. Parker called his new ink feeding system the Lucky Curve. As sales slowly built, the company moved into the upper floor of a downtown Janesville building, and Parker expanded his own pen-making operation. Back in those days, the primary material for fountain pens was hard rubber. And it was a very simple, relatively speaking, process to carve it by lathe, maybe by hand, and decorate it and make it more unique. As his pens developed a good reputation across the country, George Parker began to mix business with pleasure, fulfilling his childhood dream of traveling the world while at the same time opening up new markets. Whenever he traveled anywhere, whether it was Egypt or China, he always traveled with a large supply of Parker pens. With the coming of World War I, the War Department awarded Parker a contract for a pen to be used by soldiers in the field, known as the trench pen. And he had little pills made ink pills. So you'd put the pill in the reservoir and then fill it full of water. And the water and pill would mix and you'd have ink. And then he advertised that and that became very popular and it introduced the name to a lot of people. After the war, both of Parker's sons became involved in the company's management. George groomed his oldest son, Russell, to take over for him, while his second son, Kenneth, a former World War I aviator, took charge of the advertising department. With sales passing a million dollars in 1918, Parker designed a modern office and manufacturing center built in downtown Janesville, and the company would remain one of the city's largest employers for the next 70 years. At a time when most fountain pens were black, his sons convinced a reluctant George Parker to release their new dual-fold pen in a way that seemed outrageous at the time. Kenneth Parker came up with an idea for a, a bright mandarin red thick pen. And it was totally different from the rest of the market. And his father said, you're crazy, that'll never sell. It sold very well, very well. It was large. It was in-your-face large, but I believe in perfect sync with the times. It was flamboyant, and the 20s were nothing if they were not flamboyant. It was also somewhat expensive, and this seemed to have the effect of making it more desirable. So the dual fold was really the pen that put Parker Pen on the map. The pen that put Parker on the world map also put Janesville, Wisconsin there with it. There are really two names imprinted on the side of the pen. The Parker name is there, of course, but Janesville is there too. It showed that George was proud of his home. It showed that he was proud of the craftsmanship and the quality that was built into those pens. In the 1930s, Parker introduced another new pen, the Vacumatic, which featured a distinctive arrow clip that remains the symbol of Parker pens to this day. The pen proved to be yet another peak in George Parker's long career as the world's leading pen maker. As he looked forward to retirement, however, his world began to unravel. George's eldest son, Russell, died very suddenly in January of 1933. It's 
easy for me to imagine why George would have been just crushed. A deeply saddened George Parker soon withdrew from the business that bore his name, and four years later, he died. The company was now in the hands of Kenneth Parker, the risk-taking aviator, who began a project to completely redesign the fountain pen from the chemistry of the ink to the point of the nib. That pen was to become the Parker 51. It's considered to be, in all likelihood, the best fountain pen ever made. At first, the sales of the 51 were slowed by World War II, as the Parker plant retooled to produce bomb fuses, winning three of the military's E awards for excellence. But Parker pens also held the distinction of ending the war, as General Eisenhower sent two of his Parker 51s to be used in signing the German surrender papers. Victory with the pens of peace. In the Pacific, General MacArthur signed the Japanese surrender using his 20-year-old duofold. With the end of World War II, the Parker 51 exploded in terms of sales. Production was nonstop. It was truly remarkable. In 1947, Parker Penn sponsored a parade to celebrate international trade, which eventually would account for two-thirds of its sales. In the 1950s, the advent of carbon copies had even the Janesville police switching to a new kind of writing instrument, the Jotter Ballpoint. Get the Jotter made by Parker with the team of Kimber. Where else can you buy so much pen for $1.98? And it's a Parker. Today at Janesville's Rotary Gardens, there is a memorial to the Parker Pen Company, which was sold during the leveraged buyouts of the 1980s. This is the arch that surrounded the front entrance to Parker Penn's Court Street offices and factory. And a lot of people have passed under this arch. Employees, visitors from all over the world, and all of them had something to do with Parker Penn's success. And it's terrific that this arch was preserved so that other people who've walk through those doors, can come back here and remember those times. The archway over the front door of the Parker Pen Factory on East Court Street, seen here, now resides at Rotary Gardens. But in 1940, as Janesville's second largest employer, that archway proudly welcomed workers inside to make some of the finest pens in the world. Parker Pen was already an international success. As early as the 1920s, George Parker had made extensive world tours, establishing a network of overseas distributors for his products. When this footage was taken inside the Parker factory, the best-selling Parker model was the Vacumatic, introduced in 1933. The Vacumatic was popular because it could hold more ink than other pens. In fact, it held over twice as much as Parker's famous Duofold pen, a pen that would be reintroduced in the 1970s as the Big Red. The Vacumatic also marked the first appearance of the Aero-style clip, which has since become Parker's most identifiable trademark. In 1939, a small blue diamond was added to the top of the arrow clip, signifying that the pen was guaranteed for life. In 1941, a few months after this footage was shot, Parker introduced the Parker 51 fountain pen, named because it was the result of research conducted in Parker's 51st year. It was so different from conventional pens that Parker promoted it as being like a pen from a different planet. The Parker 51 became such a success that Parker could not make enough of them to keep up with the demand. Parker at one point even took out advertising apologizing for the shortage. 
In countries outside of the U.S., the Parker 51 was literally worth its weight in gold. Parker Penn's factory operations later moved to a larger facility on Janesville's north side, which was dubbed Arrow Park. Parker's headquarters remained in the building seen here, which was extensively remodeled in the 1970s to become the One Parker Place building. The shepherd will tend his sheep, the valley will bloom again, and Jimmy will go to sleep in his own little room again. There'll be The white cliffs of Dover Tomorrow Just 
just you wait and see. Your restaurant must be unique, so discreet that waiters are discouraged from mingling with the diners, and a seafood risotto that you can reassure your chef lingers even now in the memory. The Parker Duofold, guaranteed for a lifetime of self-expression. The new Duofold collection is a tribute to that early commitment, and to the craftsmen who made it possible. The manufacturing process is a perfect blend of the most advanced technology with the traditional skills of human hand and eye. Designed with the aid of the latest in CAD-CAM systems, the minute veins of the ink feed unit are precisely calibrated to allow only the most controlled exchange of ink and air, regardless of the surrounding atmosphere. George Parker's goal at last. The nib itself was first produced on tools modeled by hand at the craftsman's bench. This experience fed the computer-controlled processes that produced the tungsten carbide dies that punch and form the solid gold sheet. It takes four days to complete a single nib, to weld and shape the minute ball of rare metals to the tip, which provides the characteristic smooth flow across the page. Each nib is slit by hand, using an almost invisibly fine blade, then polished for more than two days in a softly turning drum full of walnut shells and wax. The famous Parker arrow is added in ruthenium and the nib polished again by hand to final perfection. To maintain this level of individual involvement in every detail of the pen's construction, has challenged the traditional organization of the workplace. Take so simple an item as the clip, for instance. Traditionally, such components are manufactured in their thousands, being stamped here, polished there, plated in another area. All the time, being stored in large numbers in various warehouses. Quality ceases to be the concern of the individual worker, and instead is left to the end, when the final inspector discards any substandard but fully manufactured elements. Here, by contrast, a dedicated team takes a small batch, and a member of that team sees the whole process complete from blank to finished clip. Commitment to quality is easily maintained at every stage by the individual responsible and supported by the team. A 
real sense of personal pride. Ownership is immediately gained. Inventory is minimized and turnaround radically reduced, making the whole company much more responsive to the marketplace. Small enhancements like the new raised embossing of the arrow are quickly incorporated into the production process. World-class manufacturing for a world-class product. Signing is what we'd like you to do right now. This book here. As large as you like. Parker Penn when I was young, 
uh, and it still is a habit to sign with one. Indeed, I signed those certificates, you'll be delighted to know, with a Buerfeld pen that was given to me at the Toronto Economic Summit. That's rather good, isn't it? Summit of the top seven countries, and I signed, given a, a pen there, and we signed a certificate with them. I noticed that you had a management buyout from the United States company. I noticed, too, that whereas the company under its other ownership was making a loss, you turned it round to making a really good profit. I know the effort that went into that. I know that you have to have superb design, superb manufacturing, excellent marketing, excellent administration, and above all, the greatest possible cooperation and spirit among all the people who work here, and you've got it all. I'm just as delighted as you are that you're now working for a company which, through your efforts, makes a pretty good profit, because everyone wants to know that they're doing well, and that is one of the signs of success. It also means that there is a great future, because if you've got a profit, there's plenty to plow back to invest for the future, and that too you are doing. There's another very special reason why I should be pleased that you make a profit. It gives the chance of the Exchequer something to tax. <laughs> Once again, we can say, British is best. <laughs> it is an immense privilege for me to be able to present those long service certificates, particularly when it came to 47 years service, because I've only done 30 years, so there's hope for me here. <laughs> and that really was extremely good. And I'm also very pleased that the history of this company is such that Winston Churchill used your Parker pens, that President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev used the Parker pens to sign the great uh, Intermediate Nuclear Weapon Reduction Treaty, a treaty achieved in our time, a treaty that I think Britain had something to do with because after all, I knew Mr. Gorbachev and I knew President Reagan and had something to do with their getting together. <laughs> you really have had part of the history of this country running through your pens. It's been fascinating to go around. You've got the latest technology, the latest engineering, the latest designs, and you're not only right up front, you're ahead of the rest. May you stay ahead of the rest. My best wishes to the, for the future, for the coming hundred years, and many congratulations on all your efforts to date.
to see such a large crowd and hopefully a very generous crowd because tonight is about children in need. Um, we could have sold the tickets many times over. In fact, the only reason I'm, I'm here tonight to be able to get the tickets is because I've agreed to do the speech. <laughs> so I'm very proud to present for your entertainment at great expense and loss of life <laughs> the entire cast with We Are The World.
A Sussex company have started to make a range of pens from redundant Russian and American missiles. The Parker Company, based at New Haven, are calling them peace pens and will give the profits to a special fund for disaster relief. Well, today the scheme received the blessing of a Russian Red Army colonel. Mark Bishop reports. Colonel? It was the first time a commander of Russian nuclear forces has been outside the Soviet Union. Today he was in New Haven, where he arrived 40 minutes late for his tour of Parker Pen. But after meeting Chairman Jack Margrey, he was quickly into his stride around the shop floor, where he was shown how former missile components have been turned into fountain pens. Well, it may look like a piece of old bathtub, but it's not. It's part of an old SS Pershing missile. It's been smelted down into one of these ingots, and then after it's been smelted even more, this is the end product. A wonderful fountain pen, 185 pounds. Through the help of an interpreter, Colonel Kalugin said he was pleased that the Russian SS-20 and American Pershing missiles were now firing blanks and raising money for a good cause. He thinks it, it is a wonderful thing that we turn in missiles into pens. Finally. And it is very peaceful and very honorable. All profits from the sales of the special pens will go to the Memorial Fund for disaster relief. Colonel Kalugin now has his own Parker pen. He does have six others, but they're all Russian. And not one of them, he says, has a hidden microphone. Mark Bishop, Coast to Coast, New Haven.
Almost 25% of the world's population can't read or write. Today, the Parker Pen Company, UNICEF and Lord Attenborough launched a global campaign to make a difference. What better than literacy? I mean, when we know that a quarter of the world's population is illiterate, cannot read, cannot write, how can they progress? How can they improve their circumstances? How can they use vision? How can they, through wonderful words and writing and literature, understand things outside their normal experience. That seems to me terribly important. Called the Parker Words of Inspiration appeal, celebrities like Patsy Kensett are contributing to an anthology with words that inspired them. The pen they're using is a special Parker limited edition. It's modelled on the snake pen first made in 1906. The Parker Words of Inspiration appeal is aimed at countries like India, Mali and Rwanda, where illiteracy is the norm. UNICEF and the Parker Pen Company want to see more schools like this one in India, where children come because they enjoy it. Or like here in Rwanda, where the School in a Box program provides emergency supplies, while makeshift classrooms try to bring some semblance of a normal life to the youngest victims of war. The Parker Words of Inspiration anthology and the snake pen left by Courier to tour the UK before leaving for Europe, where a host of celebrities have agreed to make inscriptions. The anthology will be auctioned in New York in October with a collection of the limited edition Parker snake pens. All the money raised will be given to UNICEF to develop children's literacy education. They make 40 million pens a year here, most of them untouched by human hand, until they get to Sue Ashdown. This job is called spotting and basically all I'm doing is checking the nibs and making sure there aren't any defects and then we write a test with them to make sure that they're writing okay, nice and smoothly, got a, a good ink flow through. But it's not all mass production. The 18 karat gold nibs are still made by hand using techniques which haven't changed in 50 years. It takes 30 different operations to produce one nib. Well, this is quite interesting because this is a pen that was made for the soldiers in the First World War. That's called a trench pen. And the thing about this was that uh, the soldiers out there in the trenches couldn't obviously go and buy bottles of ink. So they had uh, tablets of black pigment contained inside the pen, which when dropped into a small beaker of water or a small container of water, turned into ink, they could fill the pen and they could write home to their loved ones. In 1948, the company opened a factory in New Haven. Pony Eager was one of its first employees, making pens which were then very much a luxury item. In those days, all of the nibs that was in the pens were 14 karat or 18 karat gold. So when I used to go out in my best suit on a Sunday afternoon, I had the cap in my top pocket with the clip on it, but nothing underneath it. <laughs> then, as now, the company employed large numbers of women to do the delicate nib work, 
One of them was Pony's wife, Pearl. They were the only people in the factory who used to be issued with protective clothing. It wasn't to protect them, really. It was just to absorb any dust or anything that came off the gold nibs. And at the end of the week, all those overalls and caps would be thrown into the wash basket and they would be laundered in a special laundry room and the washings and the sludge would go into a great big tank. And every six months, Johnson Matthew would come down and collect that sludge and take it back to their factory and extract the gold from that sludge.